If there's been a sermon that's going to be hard to preach, it's this one. Because I'm going to say that probably 90% of you will say, I don't think that's true. I don't agree with you. Well, let me assure you of something. It's my sermon for myself. So if you catch on to it, jump on and ride. Because this is more conflicting than anything we have in our society today is about the role of government. But more than that, we need to talk about what's our role as Christians towards the government. And I hope, pray that you listen to what I'm saying this morning and what the Scripture says and understand the background in which Paul was writing the book of Romans, what was taking place during that period of time. It wasn't like the environment we live in today. It was lived in an environment where the ruler persecuted Christians by torturing them, throwing the lines in, setting them on fire, whatever he could do to snuff out their religious faith. Also keep this in mind too. As we proceed as a nation, as we proceed as a world, the Bible that I read, the Bible that you should read, tells us that each one of us is headed for either heaven or hell, right? Based on our decision about Jesus Christ. The church preaches not politics. The church preaches Jesus Christ crucified. And we vote. We say we vote Jesus. Now what does that do? Well, I'm, I'm going to be talking about because a lot of conflict happens even in the church if we don't go back to the basics of who we are and who God called us to be. Also remember this before we get into the text. We're called to be ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador represents Jesus Christ. Then you have to ask yourself, how would Jesus Christ represent himself in the world we live in today? Would he be at peace with all things? Or would he be troubled? I think you know the answer if you search your heart. He wouldn't be troubled because he, knew, he knows what's happening already. and he, Everything's according to his plan. And another thing is, understand this. If you believe in the sovereignty of God, things are working out according to his plan and it won't work out according to our plan. Even the plan goes against what we thought was right. That's all through the history of the Bible. God places in power the people he desires to be in power for his particular purpose and his reason and not ours. This is why a sermon's hard to preach but for me because it goes against my grain. It goes against my flesh. But it, it's true in the spirit. See, that's one of the things I know in, when I studied this. And I told someone a long time ago, I said, at some point in time, I'm going to bring a sermon on this text. Well, I thought, what better way to do it on Independence Day weekend? This is the weekend of it. We have freedom from a foreign government in this country, but we don't have freedom from sin unless we trust Jesus Christ. And sin is all sin. That means even complaining, arguing, or causing dissension. That's sin, too. So since we've been delivered from all that, we don't need to get back into that. We need to do our, our civic duty and vote and come to church and worship the Lord because, listen to me a minute, there's three institutions that were ordained by God. The family. Does the Bible speak about the family a great deal? Yes. He ordained civil government and he also ordained the church. Those three institutions, what God says is important to him, and if those three are important to him, then they've got to be important to us and how we operate our lives. I only pray that after preaching this sermon, I can believe what I preach and act on it. That's important. How many people you think get in conversations about politics and religion? Not as much about religion as do politics. Politics has become the dividing agent in our country. It even divides people that, that are related to each other. Makes people mad, makes people angry. It doesn't do that if you understand that God has everything in His control and He's in power, and whatever He chooses to do, He's going to do. All we need to do is act according to the Scripture tells us today. So let's read through it. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist. Are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority risks the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good, good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, and venture to execute wrath on him who practices evil. 
Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for there are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Let me pray. Father God, as I bring this message this morning, <coughs> please allow me to speak from your spirit and my spirit as we're united together as one in this body of believers, that with truth will come through our, my mouth and through our hearts from your word, and we'll act accordingly to bring peace in this world and be examples for others to see how we're supposed to live as believers. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. One of the issues in our world today is the crime that takes place in our country. And that's one of the main things we talk about a lot on the news and immigration, all those things. And all those are issues that we all should be concerned about. But I'm not going to get into each, each one of those individual issues to talk about them because everybody's got different plans or ideas of how to all be solved. But when it comes to, to this world and you ask what's this world coming to, let me tell you what this world's coming to. It's coming to destruction one day. Not because of who we elect so much, but because of the fact how people act. England itself has become more Islamic than it has in the past. And the reason that for that is, I read an article on this that said the reason Islam is spreading in England like it is, is because when you commit a crime in Islam, you get punished immediately. People today are looking for people that would stand up for them and somebody commits a crime, they get what they need right then. But in our country today, it seems like when someone commits a crime, they get out three or four times, and they get on what I used to call when I was in law enforcement, double secret probation. Double secret probation. They keep doing the same crime over and over again because of probation, and we're the victims of it. And people are getting tired of that in this country. And so they want someone to give the answer to it. Remember this if we go through this. It says, let every soul be subject to government authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And they exist because they're appointed by God. Now, you, if you don't get that first verse of Scripture in your heart and think about what it says, that there, these things I'm talking about, these entities, this government entities, whether it be city government, county government, state government, federal government, they're all designed and ordained by God. He expects us to live in peace with those governments as Christians. Because you remember this, we're not part of this world. We live in it, but we're not part of this world. The Bible tells us we're aliens and strangers to this world. The world system as a whole is something the Bible tells us in Romans to abhor because the world standards are not our standards according to the Christian standards. In fact, I'm going to read some verses of Scripture for you to help you understand this. If you go back to Romans chapter 12, and read some of those verses. You don't have to go there unless you get your Bibles open. It says, Let love be the hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Now, if there's evil going on in our world, I don't care what it is from abortion to illegal immigration, whatever it may be that we see as evil, that's okay. We don't have to stand for it. We can vote against it. But we don't fight people to get what we want. We don't cause dissension within the church because of people disagreeing. Because remember, we have one mission in the church. That's to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. That means those people that are committing crimes, we pray for them. And boy, I'm going to tell you, it's real hard to pray for somebody who's done evil against another person because we want justice. But the Bible tells us to do those kind of things to show we'll be examples in the world for people to see how Christians live their lives different from non-Christians. If we're just like the world and non-Christians, then we're no different than they are. But Jesus called us to a higher standard where we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And the question comes in, but they're not my neighbor. They don't live next door to me. Our neighbor is anybody that God creates, that God calls us to witness to as believers. How many of us in this room used to do the wrong things because we didn't know God? Nobody going to raise your hand? We all did. We all are guilty. When the gospel message came to us and we received Jesus Christ in our hearts, it didn't mean we became perfect Christians, but what we did, there's something changed. Now we, we abhor, abhor evil. We hate evil because evil destroys us. So that's why we hate evil because God is love and God loves us and He wants our life to be better. But evil came in the world and evil wants to destroy us. So you've got to make a decision. Do I love God's love and His Christ's love for me so I'm motivated by that love? Or do I 
through the evil these other people are doing to get back at them. It says also be patient in tribulation. Paul saying that, remember, while Nero was playing the fiddle, so to speak, and sacrificing Christians at his altar. How, does that, how can he be patient during those times? The same way the early church fathers and, and Paul and, and the disciples, when they went to their grave in their death because they were martyred for their faith, they prayed for people, they loved people, but they died because of Jesus Christ. None of us are called yet to die for our faith. There may be a time when we live long enough and Christ doesn't come back soon enough. We may be questioned, we may be questioned by our faith and someone says, do you believe in Jesus Christ? If you say you believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to be dead on the spot right now. What's your word? If you know Jesus Christ and you know that when you take your last breath, you're going to be with Him in heaven and you're going to stand up for Him because He loves you and He died for you, you're going to say the right thing. You're going to say, I trust Jesus Christ and let them do what they got to do. But have you ever heard stories about people that prayed for people that hurt someone in their family and they forgave them and prayed for them and developed a relationship with them? I told him the other night in Bible study about Johnny Butler. He used to go to this church. He had a video, uh, audio tape I listened to. A man killed someone in, in a guy's family. And the guy went to the guy in the, in the prison to meet with him because the Lord worked a, a miracle in his heart. I call it a miracle. And caused him to have grace in his heart where he went and forgave that guy for what he did to his family. Now, I, some people would say, there's no way that I'm going to do this. You will if you allow grace to penetrate your heart and heart. If I allow grace to penetrate my heart and heart, I can do anything that Christ asked me to do because I'm doing it for Him. And that's tough. Because we're fighting the flesh and the devil. Flesh says, no, you get revenge. You tell that guy you hope he goes to hell. Christ says, no, I want to redeem you from hell. No matter what your sentence is, I want to redeem you from the pit of hell. I watched a guy this week on YouTube I don't know why I was looking this stuff up for, but I was looking up about this guy was a Buddhist. And he was on death row. And I told him this other night in church, so y'all had to listen to me again. But he, he didn't commit a murder. But he's on death row in Texas. He's about to be given the injection. But in Texas, if you're with someone else that commits a capital murder, you killed a police officer, then your sentence is the same as capital murder and you get capital punishment. And so when he's facing what he's facing... Instead of embracing Jesus Christ, he embraced Buddhism. And I, I looked up Buddhism, so what do, they, what do they believe? I knew something about it. They wouldn't carry out the sentence on him because he got to stay. And the reason he got to stay was the law said if his Buddhist teacher or whatever he was, teacher or preacher or whatever he was, wasn't there, they couldn't do it. He had to be there. Now what I'm thinking is, because every time as a police officer, when I saw people die, and I've seen my share of people dying, what always went through my mind was the fact, what happens to this person at the moment of death? What is it exactly takes place when that person says, I don't want God in my life, and then they go out, and they go out knowing that God is their judge, but yet they're holding on to some kind of Buddhist religion or Islamic religion or athe- athe- atheistic religion where they say, I don't believe there's a God, but yet somebody's telling them, trust Jesus Christ because God loves you. I hate the consequences of that person's life. What's going to happen to them? That's why we act as ambassadors of Christ because there's no one God says is unworthy of salvation. It says in Ezekiel, He doesn't desire the wicked to be condemned or go to hell. He desires all men to be saved. I think it says in the book of Timothy. If He desires all men to be saved, then He tells us that no matter what the government says, how bad the government is, then God's authority is we're living with God's authority because God's the one we listen to and not the President of the United States, not the governor. They, they're called to govern. Now listen to me a minute. In this text, you notice they're responsible too. They're responsible to God because they're called by God, just like I'm responsible to God because I'm called by God to preach the truth about what I'm saying, what the Scripture says. If you want peace in your life, follow Christ. If you want to be, have conflict in your life, listen to the world. Now, when I say listen to the world, we have something we didn't have when I was a kid, when things were going bad. We didn't have social media. We didn't have the Internet. And when you have Twitter, Facebook, Google, I don't care what else you got, you have, you have on your phone. If you listen to all that enough, you go crazy. In other words, you always get your mindset from what you read instead of what it says in here. 
I, I can do that easily. If I read what goes on in the world and forget what this book says, then I get caught up just like anyone else does. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is in control? He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Raise your hand. If you can't raise your hand, you come down the aisle after a while. Because He is Lord of lords. He is King of kings. And He rules from heaven in my heart and your heart. He's not here with us in the present physical sense, but He's with us in spiritual sense. It says rulers are not heir to good works, but to evil. Now, I know what you're thinking already. Well, what about Nero? Is he doing good works? Here's the catch. Did Israel... Let me set this way. Don't get me wrong again, but you've got to listen. Did God do a good work when He allowed millions of Jews to be sacrificed, to be killed? You say, how could that be a good work? What happened to the nation of Israel after that? They became a nation. Does the Bible talk a lot about Israel in the last days? Sure it does. Does God have a plan of action? He's put, put it in place already today that we don't know anything about. Does He ask us just trust Him? I'm going to put it on a smaller level. How many of you have been pulled over for? Raise your hand if you've been pulled over. What was your attitude? Did you say, oh, thank you, Officer Perry, for pulling me over? Or did you say, why don't you go out and get a real job? I had a doctor I pulled over one night. I'm not going to call his name. I will say his position. He was a surgeon. You know how surgeons can be sometimes. Not all of them want to. He told me I should be out arresting drunk drivers. Well, while he was driving, I thought he was drunk. And then you pull over some and say, thank you for doing your job. Police officers are hired to protect the public. Remember, that department is controlled by a mayor and city council. Just like a state trooper is controlled by the state. The federal agents are controlled by the federal government. But we're all doing our work for God. That's why I used to when I taught a conflict resolution class to police officers how to treat people on the street. I always told them this, this one thing. The state of Tennessee, the city of Columbia, gives you authority to do what you have to do. But your power comes through how you react to them. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have authority as Christians in Jesus Christ's name to speak the word of God to other people because he tells us we can do that. No government entity can tell us to shut up. Remember this, just because the government tells us we can't do something, if it's, if it's God telling us we do so, had to do certain things, we do it. Daniel was told not to pray, wasn't he? But he prayed anyway. And he got thrown in the lion's den, didn't he? And the fiery furnace. What fiery furnace will we be thrown in? What lion's den will we be thrown in? Because we stand up for our faith when that time comes. And I really believe unless the Lord comes back, there's a chance that some people in this world will face persecution like they've never seen before. If you live in a box and never read what's going on in the world outside of what you see on the Internet, if you don't look at things like I always tell you to look at, look at the voice of the martyrs. Every time I get that magazine in, I read it and look at these people in these other countries that are starving to death, being, being killed for their faith, and we're living in plenty. That makes you stop and think about how important it is to understand how blessed we are in this country. And when people are called to execute wrath on people that are doing evil, remember this. When your house is getting broken into at night, you call the police usually, don't you? That police officer, whether he or she comes to your house, is risking their lives to protect your property and protect you. When we have people crossing our borders by the thousands, and maybe millions someday, I don't know, thousands, it's like saying, come on into my house and do what you want to do, go unchecked. When you have babies being boarded by people that don't care about babies, say life doesn't begin in the womb, ask David that. David said, you knew me in my inward parts, you formed me in my inward parts. Every life is important to God. Even those lives I'm talking about get capital punishment, they're important to God. All life is. And he's called us as Christians to stand up for what's right, abhor what's evil. You vote accordingly, folks. Don't go out and tell everybody you're going to vote. Just vote accordingly. You can do whatever you want to do. But if you want to start strife, tell people how you're going to vote. If you want to cause hardships at work, do that. If you want to cause people not to like you, listen, it's getting to the point in this world that it's, you're going to see violence on the street on both sides when this election's over with. Verse 5. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. 
the reason we do what we do is not just because we fear the wrath of God's authority and people's authority against us. Listen to your conscience. Listen to that small, still voice within you that tell you what's right and what's wrong. For me personally, when I get, I remember that word I use all the time, a tizzy. When I get in a tizzy and get upset about something going on in the world, it's always the Bible that brings me back. And I, my kids know this. I tell them this all the time because when they get on Twitter and all that stuff, I say, just, just understand God's sovereign. But then I might get right in the loop with them. It's catching, isn't it? I've been in church a long time. And we used to get together and we talk about different things, but somewhere it always leads to politics. Because it's one reason is because we think we can control one iota of life. And we can't control the day we breathe. We can't control the breath that's in us. God gives us that breath. He gives us the brain to think with. He gives us the body to work with. He gives our tongue to speak with. And He wants us to do those things that are pleasing to Him. Verse 6, For because of this you also pay taxes, for there are God's ministers attending continue this very thing. Oh my goodness. Death and taxes. But Jesus talked about taxes too. I'm going to read this verse to you. He and, he and Peter were dealing with this in Capernaum. When they come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying that. What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or strangers? Peter said to him, From strangers. Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, take a fish that comes up first, and when you open his mouth, you'll find a piece of money, take that out, give it to them for me and you. Why did Jesus do that for? He didn't have to. To show him what love does. What respect does. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sin, doesn't it? This is what love does when it's in action, not when it's just talked about. When love is not hypocritical, Love is real. When you see someone that hurts another person, it's okay to get angry at them and hate the evil that's in them, but don't hate the person. See, the problem is today, the reason we have trouble being ambassador for Christ, we, we can't separate the evil from the person, but we can separate the, our evil from their evil, though, can't we? Have you ever said this, but by the grace of God, there do I? Should we say that? Not really. Because that person is getting grace too. They just don't understand it. They're getting grace just like we're getting grace. Jesus said that because of the fact that He says, I don't, he basically, He don't want to hurt people. He wants people to see His love for people. So He says, Render therefore to all their due their taxes. And you know, we talk about death and taxes like it's something bad. Taxes actually support us. In fact, taxes actually take care of us in some ways when we talk about taxes are too high. They waste too much money. Maybe that'd be true, but again, vote your conscience. But don't start arguments and get in disputes over politics because that doesn't represent Jesus Christ. And it doesn't bring peace in your soul. I don't know about you, but every time I get upset about something, I don't have peace. I don't. And if I don't have peace, my family doesn't have peace. Because I'm irritable. Somebody better say amen in the corner. You've heard, it, you've heard these people say about the amen corner in old churches? Well, that's my amen corner. What I'm saying to you folks, don't let what goes on in this world cause us to lose our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and act like He doesn't exist. Because He does exist. He exists, and not only that, He's coming back. He's coming back for the body of Christ, the church. We take communion today to represent His death that He paid on the cross, not just for the good people. And we're not that good either, are we? He came to pay the price for all people, all mankind, no matter how evil they are. If somebody has committed murder like Hitler did, if Hitler had only asked Jesus Christ to forgive him, people have trouble with this in the flesh, he would have forgave him. But he wouldn't ask. Sometimes what causes people to ask for, to believe in Jesus Christ, they don't, and you don't even really have to ask anything of Jesus. You just believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I don't find any place in the Bible that says ask Jesus to come in your heart, except in Revelation it says knock on the door and ask, and he'll open the door. But what it does say, believe the Scripture. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came in the flesh, died on the cross, and He's, he's risen from the dead. And he's, the Bible says He's sitting in heaven acting as our advocate, our attorney, representing us when Satan comes to Him and says, look at them. 
You ever been condemned in your heart because something you said, something you did, and you knew it wasn't in line with Christ? I bet you have. If you hadn't, your heart's hardened. When you do wrong, your conscience is your guide because your conscience, conscience as a Christian is controlled by God because you have His Spirit. Remember this, when you get saved, you don't just stay the same. When you get saved, your whole, whole life changes. If your whole life changes, then we start acting according to what the Bible says that we know is true. And if we don't, we'll continue to live in conflict and not peace. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that this morning I've done due diligence in presenting this message. It's so difficult sometimes to live as a believer in this world that tells us to live with the flesh. And He shows us how to live in the flesh. But your word shows us and teaches us and requires us to walk with you. Salvation came to each one of us as we trusted in what you did and we believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And your word says we're sealed on the day of redemption. We belong to you. You tell us our citizenship's in heaven, not in this world, but yet you still tell us to be shining lights in this world we live in. Help us to do that. Don't let our hearts come, become hardened because of what we hear on the news or read on the internet. Help us to love people like you love people. Those that are facing abortion issues, help us to love them and pray for them. People that are coming over here illegally, let's pray for them as well, Lord, that maybe they, if they do come they get in this country, they'll find out who Jesus Christ is and they'll receive you as their Lord and Savior and change their family members. The world's not going to be changed only way through prayer and witnessing and your power. And we acknowledge that this morning. As we come together this morning to... to uh, honor you and come remember you through our the Lord's Supper here in front of us. Let us remember what that wine represents or the grape juice represents. It represents your blood that was shed for mankind. The bread broken for us. We give you thanks. If there's someone here this morning doesn't know you, we always ask, Lord, that you work in their hearts where they come to know you. They just believe the simple message of the gospel in their hearts. And watch the work you do in their lives from that point on. And give you the glory. I pray these things in his name. Amen.